What's up, everybody? Welcome back for another Friday. Hope you guys had a great week. We have a weekend ahead, and into this into this weekend, we have some pretty spicy stuff going on. Um, we've got some charts to look at, as always, but there's some interesting maybe pieces of news or information that I want to go over. We have a special guest today who's going to be joining us in just a few minutes. I wanted to start this stream with this chart. Some of you might know what it is. Don't ruin the surprise. Uh, how would you feel about Bitcoin if this was the weekly chart? Would you be feeling a little bit more bullish? Would you be feeling bearish? Well, this actually is technically Bitcoin's chart, but this is obviously not Bitcoin spot as it's only 20 bucks. This is GBTC or Grayscale's Bitcoin. And what's been really interesting to see over the last few months is that GBTC has basically decoupled or seemingly decoupled from Bitcoin, and in my opinion, is looking much more bullish than the Bitcoin spot chart itself. Uh, zooming in, you can see that on this weekly close in three hours, we're basically closing at our highs here for GBTC. Uh, this definitely deviates from Bitcoin if I throw this up really quick. Hopefully. Hopefully really quick. There we go. Throw this up really quick. You can see a very different picture here. So what is the value of this? Or you know, why are you telling us about this? Well, this isn't really hopium or anything. This is just interesting because you can see over the course of Bitcoin, GBTC and Bitcoin have been very, very closely correlated. There are some differences you can see kind of different highs and lows. And I think we can attribute some of that to weekend trading not being included on this chart. But if we compare these two, GBTC is looking much healthier. This uh, weekly close this week is not looking great, though it did bounce off our support. Thank goodness. Uh, but this is looking a little weak, whereas GBTC looks strong. So that kind of ties in to a lot of the things going on here this week. The SEC has a deadline at midnight tonight to file an appeal against the judge's ruling of kind of a, what is it, the arbitrary or not treating assets the same. Maybe our guest can help us out. Maybe not. Um, but uh, this is a big day, and there are is reason to maybe think that this is front running maybe what's going to happen into this weekend i don't know i definitely welcome your guys thoughts uh here's what we're going to do if you guys could just hype the stream a little bit subscribe like share engage that will help youtube show this to new people and we have an awesome guest personal friend of mine we've known each other for years and i believe he's going to have some i don't want to say insider information but some kind of information that we might not have as retail because we have the CEO of Femex, our sponsor. By the way, sign up with Femex. Links in the video description below. You guys know the deal. Our sponsor, Federico. How you doing, brothers? Good to have you here. We got you on. <laughs> hey, guys. There you are. Um, hey, Tom. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Always. Um, always, man. What's up? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We had some trouble. My camera kept messing up. That's why we were late. So uh, <laughs> we had to do this a little ghetto. But you are on. We got you live. And oh, uh, I'm sure the audience is going to come up with some great questions for you. I'll try to field those if I catch them. But i um, kind of interested. I think you might have a really unique perspective on a lot of these things going on right now. As Femex is a long-standing big exchange in the crypto yeah. space and I mean, us as retail, we only get to see the user interface. We don't see anything going on in, in the background. Yeah. So I think everybody would love to hear anything you can share, whether it comes to like FTX, kind of the things they did, because I don't really know, um, versus what good exchanges do or don't, you know, don't do those things. Uh, maybe yeah. if you have any insights on SEC ruling or anything, I don't know if that's in your field house, but uh, anything you can grace us with, I think would be awesome. Right. Um, so I think it's a very interesting period now in crypto. Um, what's happening with the FTX trial and the ETF thing happening at the same time? Um, I'm not sure it's, if it's the best narrative for, for crypto right now, uh, since it's a lot of <laughs> negative attention being brought on uh, due, to, due to FTX. Um, at the same time, I'm hopeful that uh, we will get some, some more uh, attention, more eyes in, in the industry uh, once that's done. Um, so I remain cash, uh, cautiously optimistic. Um, I think the, the FTX uh, trial is revealing a lot of things about um, 
how FTX grew the way they did. So what the other exchanges could potentially learn in terms of uh, successful marketing, brand awareness, business development, mm -hmm. but also the practices that were uncovered were, uh, I would say, um, pretty unethical. And uh, of course, um, people were actually surprised to find out for how long Alameda, for example, has been insolvent. So I think um, there are a few interesting points coming out now that we didn't know about. Um, and I think it's a blueprint of what not to do when you're running an exchange or uh, um, if you're a market maker. And I think mm. uh, it's things that other exchanges know, but um, I, I think it's good that it's finally coming out. Yeah, definitely not the most positive narrative. I don't really expect a positive narrative right now. Um, I mean, maybe the ETF mixes things up and we kind of get a 180 on that yes. but at the moment to expect a super positive narrative like i remember my mom maybe two weeks ago said something she's like what happened to that what happened to that that billionaire guy and immediately i knew she meant sbf and i was like sbf she's like yeah and i was like i don't know he's in jail or something like that's what that's what the public knows you know they just see that face yeah. he's it's a memorable story um yeah i don't think people really understand the damage and what was going on behind the scenes. Like I, I read the news, but you know, the news is, is pretty crap. Um, so I don't know what to trust Caroline coming out and saying a bunch of things this week was, was pretty interesting, but I don't think it's anything anyone didn't expect, you know, like that they did, they committed fraud. They, uh, yeah. laundered money. They did, you know, they did these things that we all knew. Of course the court has to prove it. We need evidence, but, um, yeah, that's all that everyone is seeing right now. So I do hope we get some good news on the horizon that changes that. But I don't like, I don't expect it at the moment. Uh, and you said something about market makers. I would love to hear. I don't even know. And I've been in crypto and trading for years and years. And I still am a little vague on the relationship of market makers to exchanges. And I'd love to hear anything you have to yeah. say about that. So uh, it is, in fact, a, a fairly complex relation in the sense that exchanges to operate, they need good liquidity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can enter and, and leave trades um, as, exactly as you want. Uh, you don't have any slippage and you can get your fields as fast as possible. Um, but you always need someone to provide that liquidity, right? And we know uh, in crypto, especially uh, being a very volatile market, providing liquidity can be risky for, for a market maker. Uh, so we know about all those illiquid pairs that uh, are manipulated. You can see them in the market uh, sometimes when the markets are going down, like trending down. Sometimes you see some low caps altcoins so suddenly jumping 25, 50% or something in a day. And you're like, what's happening here? <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the answer is that uh, illiquid markets are very easy to, to manipulate. And in crypto, market makers tend to be a little bit less agnostics than in other markets, um, which is not a positive thing. Um, and we know, for example, that uh, what happened in FTX was Alameda for a long time was the main liquidity provider for, for the exchange, meaning that for a long period of time, every trade you took on FTX, Alameda was taking the other side, um, uh -huh. which means that every time you were going long, they were going short. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, market making is profitable, especially if the market is ranging because basically okay. the market makers they place orders around the in in, in tiers in letters mm -hmm. um around the order book and if the market is ranging they just buy and sell higher uh, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, buy low sell high but if we have like a up only market like we had in 2021 for example it's difficult for market makers to to play that out because everyone is going long right mm -hmm. and they are forced to go short but if bitcoin goes from you know like 20k to 60k in the span of a few months then some market makers are getting, you know, in, in a way they are taking the other side of that trade. So, so the yeah, market makers are in this difficult position in which they have to manage a very illiquid, very volatile market can also be profitable. And to, to, uh, to improve their profits, they sometimes they take directional trades. And I think that's what Alameda did a lot and, and they suffered <laughs> with some of these trades, which shouldn't be uh, something that market makers do generally. I see. I, you know, that's interesting. I don't know the legality or, you know, Maybe it's not even legality, but the way it's set up, I kind of in my head, I always knew about market makers. I've met some of them at events, but do exchanges do trades? Like, because there does seem like maybe there would be a conflict there, but at the same time, I don't really see the difference between having you know, a market maker come in and do it or the exchange itself do it natively, as long as they aren't you know, cooking the books or doing shady stuff. Like what, what, what is the, the deal on that? I, I don't know. The deal is that if you, if the exchange was about 
was taking trades, then they would see everyone else's stop losses and positions, and sure. they were able to hunt these stop losses, for example, or hunt their position, mm -hmm. or like manipulate the market as you want. So generally, uh, an exchange should not be market making. In crypto, we sometimes are a little bit more. Uh, we know, for example, the the CFTC ruling of Binance claimed that they used three hundred accounts for market making and why they did that because Binance is like the biggest exchange in the world and they have hundreds of spot pairs mm -hmm. hundreds of futures pair so it's yeah. difficult to find a market maker for all these pairs it's easier if you just do it yourself um, mm -hmm. so I think that's what they did at the time but of course you can do it in a like uh, I would say more agnostic way as I think Binance was doing or you can do it a little bit more aggressively which is what got Alameda in trouble uh, yeah, I can see the conflict there if, if I have unfair advantage I can see all the other orders that you can't that does, yeah, that's not fair. But at the same time, I can't really come up with a better solution other than, I guess, market makers. Like, and we have to assume they don't have that information. Um, kind of feels like someone yeah. would always have an advantage. Clearly, FTX did not have the advantage because that did not work out for them. <laughs> they had Caroline trading. Yeah, it's almost surprising because they had basically all the advantages. They could see everyone else's mm -hmm. position and they could also get their own balance going negative. So basically when, the, when yeah. everyone was getting liquidated, they could still hold on on their positions until the market was maybe bouncing back up and uh, you would avoid getting uh, liquidated, for example. So they had a lot of unfair advantages. Um, but the other thing is that one, one way they attracted users, institutional users especially, was probably by having them trade on the exchange with a positive PNL. So all these institutional players, they were trading on FTX with a positive PNL and depositing more, trading more, but Alameda was suffering all those losses. So it was kind of like um, a trade-off, which it didn't, it didn't pay off in the end. Gotcha. I, I, I'm kind of seeing a bigger picture now. I, I assumed it was all just gibberish. Like when I heard Caroline speak, that should have been such a big red flag. I still bring it up all the time when she said, I don't what's a, like what's a stop loss I don't use stop losses and and she said I don't think I've ever really had a bad trade and as a trader that was all the red flags I should have should have needed to be like this is not good you're you're like head of this big fund is saying they don't know what stop losses are uh that that should have been a red flag but that's just my own my own uh <laughs> weird memory of the whole event um yeah we we all assumed that they were extremely profitable in trading yep. So it was surprising to see that their balance sheet was negative for the whole of 2021, 20, 22 almost. So, yeah, it's very surprising. I think they cultivated an image which was uh, much different than reality. They were writing like threads about uh, after liquidation events saying on how they played it well. But of course, <laughs> they didn't write threads about all the millions of dollar losses they had from hacks or wrong trades or this kind of stuff that came out now in the in the documents. So they were just basically, they're just playing with their books and being like, we haven't lost any money. Like we're, we keep winning because they could just, you know, theory, give themselves infinite negative or infinite fake dollars until it doesn't work anymore. Right. Until something collapses and then we see the whole end of 2020 collapse. That's, that's some good insight. I was curious. They said something about, Caroline said something about um, them selling Bitcoin to keep the spot price down. <laughs> What do you think about that? Do you have any thoughts? I think that happened fairly late. Uh, so that was happening in November of 2022. So mm -hmm. I think they were already, I think they find themselves in the position in which they have maybe more, like th the reserves were fucked, but maybe they had more BTC than USDT, for example. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, we can swap this out. We can keep selling BTC for USDT. And then we can kind of like, uh, when people withdraw USDT more than they withdraw BTC because there is more in the market. Um, like in exchange generally now there is more USDT than BTC on, uh, on, 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 uh, on approximate. Um, mm -hmm. So probably they said, okay, let's sell all the BTC. So when people withdraw USDT, we have some USDT, but uh, I don't think it was enough to plug the hole. Like, and it eventually it came out anyway. You think that's reasonably, I don't want to blame something because I, I hate when it's like, that's why this happened. I, I don't like, you know, definite ABs, but do you think that that selling pressure or even not even that selling pressure specifically, but the overall kind of smoke and mirror show of FTX. Do you think that that impacted, I guess, not just Bitcoin's price, but the entire crypto market, meaning like upside in the bull run and maybe downside here uh, post-2021? Do you think that that has a significant impact on it? Yes, I think I for sure certain tokens were like, I think Bitcoin might have had a bigger peak without 
let's say, I don't want to blame other teams, but let's mm-hmm. say FTT, maybe Solana, uh, I think they received probably the the better end of the of those, of those kind of um, trades that Alameda was was taking. So maybe, you know, they were selling Bitcoin, the customer's Bitcoin, and then buying, you know, Solana or FTT to, to keep the price up or something, since they were so invested. Um, so I don't know, it's hard to say. Uh, I think maybe... Um, those tokens associated with FTX, they they benefited a lot, but now they're suffering. Like especially Solana, now it's it's suffering a lot because of that association. Yeah, there's rumors rumors that uh, Caroline alluded to being able to turn off the blockchain <laughs> to liquidate. People. I think that was fake. You think that but was fake? I think yeah, I think it was a fake screenshot of a. Of a oh, okay, it might have uh, been. <laughs> yeah. You know, it might have been. Yeah, I don't yeah. know about turning it off necessary to liquidate, but we did see Solana go down a lot in that yeah. time period and uh, to my knowledge of crypto decentralized blockchains don't go down you know, they really don't go down unless there's a major error and i haven't heard the reasons that solana was going down something about maybe conf- like no consensus reached or i don't know if you yeah, know anything about that with the notes if i remember correctly i think the the bigger uh, issue with the solana ecosystem was that so many of these tokens were in which ftx invested they were like release at insanely high fully diluted valuation, the markets were heavily manipulated, and uh, FTX would list spot and perps right away. And I believe that they were shorting heavily, they were essentially uh, shorting heavily uh, with the tokens they received from the teams to list. So I think that's part of what I think hurt the Solana ecosystem the most. I mean, it's, you, it's hard to find a Solana ecosystem token with a decent chart, even in, in 2022, not only now. Mm-hmm. They all were massacred by by predator listings so i think that's even it's almost as as uh let's say it's comparable to turning a blockchain on and off if you are literally killing every project launching on that chain mm. that's a good take um, let's see we talk a little ftx a little fcc i don't think we're gonna i don't know do you think just opinion do you think that we're gonna see anything from the uh, sec today with the appeal filing before midnight that's like uh uh, ten and a half yeah, I think, hours. I think they're going to push it one more. They can, right, until March or something. So, so there, there's definitely just like everything in crypto news. Like, there's a lot of confusion because we have a lot of similar terminology and similar yeah. kind of things going on at once. So, to my knowledge, and chat, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this is an appeal to Grayscale's suit against uh, the suit against them that a judge. Uh, determined like that it was arbitrary because they they're supposed to according to their charter treat things that are like in the same the same and so their kind of argument was you already approved as an etf in futures why are you not approving a spot one this is the same thing if anything this is probably like safer as you actually have the asset as opposed to just paper ious um but this isn't necessarily if they don't do anything we get an etf tomorrow I think this is, if they don't appeal it, I think it's going to be harder for them going forward to reject Grayscale's bid. That's, right. that's kind of my understanding of it. So it will be a good thing um, if it if they don't. But uh, I think it might be a little stupid if they do appeal it because it, it literally is treating two things that are the same differently. I don't know how you would appeal that. I'm not sure like what kind yeah. of rationale you would use. I still think though that they're going to do it too because that seems to be that seems to be their MO. Like it's not I don't know, it doesn't seem thought through. It's just push it down the road, figure it out later, yeah. point fingers and whatever. I'd I'd expect to see some red if we do get that appeal today, just because I think people are yeah. kinda hopes up that we're gonna have something big. I see a lot of titles saying like, you know, ETF's about to be approved today. I don't think that there is anything other than the SEC literally coming out on a totally different, you know, issue and saying we're approving it today. I I think that's the only way that happens. I don't think it's related at all necessarily to what's going down. Let me see if chat's correcting me. They do love correcting, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Some people saying they didn't think the price was affected too much. This is about the court decision. Appeal it or let it stand for the court decision. Okay. Thank you. That that is good clarification. Uh, this is an interesting question from Pepito. Can I ask about the level of regulation that they would welcome in exchanges using traditional rules as an example, maybe? Word for word. Um, you, right. Like, kind of like um, what regulation maybe do exchanges want? 
we can start there. Right. Um, so it's it's a difficult question because I think crypto moves at a speed which is hard for the real world to catch up with in Absolutely. that regard. And I think that's that's part of the fun, right? Like mm -hmm. um, people want to trade uh, with on futures a token as soon as it's out. They don't want to wait for some like long approval or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that regulating crypto would make it less appealing as a as a, as an instrument for for investing. I think. Uh, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it's part of the fun. The fact that it's uh, you know, new tokens every day, new narratives, meme coins. Like, is mm -hmm. are meme coins a security? You know, these this kind of questions that don't even cross my mind. You know, because mm -hmm. it's like, you know what you're getting, right? Like, you know what kind of market this is. No one is investing in in Pepe to expect like they're buying an Apple stock, right? I think some people. I hope not. Mm -hmm. I hope not. But I yeah. I fear that there are. I fear that there are people that. That don't I don't know they don't get it they're they think I don't know I I can't I don't know <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry regulation uh, I guess there is a lot of narratives uh, around that as well so I uh, it's hard to 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 say exactly what retail traders think because some projects like Safe Moon or something I believe they can be very predatory um, and if you mm -hmm. notice I think those pro those uh, projects exchanges tend to stay away from them sort of naturally right. Good. So uh, projects that have like a very predatory marketing or MLM kind of structures, mm -hmm. all these kind of things, uh, centralized exchanges naturally tend to stay away from them. So I think if we see regulations, it should not necessarily uh, attack the exchanges, but more like the project, I think, because mm -hmm. they're the one engaging in certain types of promises, marketing, white paper, all these kind of things. So I think the exchanges are kind of neutral in this regard uh they just list what people want to trade like yeah. we don't force people to 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 trade a specific token so mm -hmm. um i think regulation should look at the projects first um and uh, and then exchanges will follow whatever rules exist on that on that in that regard i agree uh could you possibly give us a little insight to femex's um maybe process or mindset on what coins you know is there a team looking into them what kind of things do they look for you know for listing new things yeah yeah, we have a research team um, that is looking at coins every day that we get, we are asked for listing. We don't do paid listings. We don't do like we listen to the to the users' request if they want to see a specific asset on the exchange. We try to to take a look at that. The main concern, of course, is the quality of the project, whether it's going to be like a long term project that is going to rug at some point, and also if there is good liquidity. So if an, if a token is on, let's say, um, a major exchange like Binance or something, OKX. Um, at that point, we're like confident that the liquidity is good yeah. enough and we're going to list it too. But we try to stay away from predatory listings of very low uh, liquidity, low cap tokens, which are just, let's say, traps for, for retail users. So we try to stay away from that. We, as an exchange, we started with futures only. So our users mostly, they prefer to trade futures. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not hunt looking for every like uh, uh, low cap altcoins in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um definitely makes sense that's good i i agree it should yes. there should be a push on the projects that's that's something you know i don't do paid promotion of a products i've had bajillion offers i've given up a lot of money uh i don't do it because i think there's something wrong with being paid to say yeah. you know you should buy this if it's an investment maybe if it's a service or something that's different but like as an investment i i think that's that's odd um and a lot of the time the kind of anger comes down on the creators where I think they're doing something wrong and I don't agree with it. But at the same time, that anger should be to the projects, right? And that's kind of the same thing with exchanges is it should be the, the regulation should be going after these projects, not kind of the people in the middle, maybe. That'd be that'd be us. <laughs> yeah. It's just projects are usually sometimes there are the team is anonymous, sometimes they're hard to track in terms of jurisdiction, sometimes, you know, they they hide their identities, kind of things. Which I think it's it's fair considering the market we're in. But it's difficult either for exchanges to like uh, get in touch with these teams sometimes. Yeah, that's what I would assume is you know, somebody wants to list or wants you to list something. And how do you even, how do you even go? Who invented Pepe? I don't know. How do you even? Yeah, that's an interesting story, actually. Okay. <laughs> I would recommend looking it up because there's a lot of conspiracy theories about that. <laughs> so, Can you share your favorite uh, one? Uh, I mean, basically, um, it could be linked to some people that worked at OpenSea, some people part of mm -hmm. the Milady ecosystem. So it's fairly like 
nuanced. Uh, you know, you can check, you can track the, the wallets and also like how it started like entering the news cycle, who was talking about it very early, uh, who was tweeting something like, hey, this person made like from 1000 to $60,000 on, on this coin made PayPal, like who, who were talking about these things, who were finding it. So I think if you can look into it, you will see that it's less, maybe less organic than what it appeared at, at, uh, at the time. Yeah, it really did come in hard, like very hot and strong, like out of nowhere, all of a sudden everything on YouTube yes. was Pepe and like, even I got into a little yeah. Pepe crazy cause that's what everyone was looking for. It's. Yeah. Making... At the time the market was very slow. So like a new mm. narrative like that, I think was positive for the industry as a whole. I'm not sure if the Pepe was the, the right token. I don't know how it will do in the future. Um, but I think, you know, like meme coins are not like a new concept. So it was very strange that this like mm -hmm. took off so quickly. Yeah. And there were, to my knowledge, there were three or four coins already with the ticker Pepe at the time. Yes. I mean, it's, it's an obvious ticker to use. Yeah. Well, it's just interesting because people were like, oh, this Pepe. And it's like, but there already were Pepe's. So if you're kind of yeah. going for the memes here, what's, what's yeah, driving you to this one? one? Yeah. yeah. Why not the original one? That yeah. was my thought process. Well, but... I think the original was on BNB. Maybe I don't remember, but I remember I, I passed on it because I, I thought the same. I said, yeah, it already exists. It's a, I know this coin, but mm -hmm. they said, no, no, this, this is different. <laughs> so uh, I passed out on an easy, like a thousand X probably because of that. It happens. It happens. It's better to yeah. miss the boat than board the Titanic. It's one of my favorite sayings. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think also the like the the bear market can like affect the way you see a project, the way you look at projects, and you think mm -hmm. like most of them are like extractive in in value or in uh, in uh, in their approach to marketing and, and and building. But some some of the best projects actually launch in, during bear markets, so um, well, someone when, has to be aware of that. When there's really nothing going on, it, like you know, price has been sideways for most of the year. I think people do just kind of latch on to whatever is moving at the time of. Oh, this is just even a break from waiting. Maybe I can, you know, make some progress where I'm waiting for everything else. And I, I get that mindset for sure. Uh, let me see. Yeah, especially after 2021 and 2022, where like you could get, I don't know, five, ten thousand dollars BT uh, moves on BTC, and now it's like nothing. So people like want, want to see some volatility anywhere. Absolutely. And I, I'm, you know, I'm victim to that as well. Like I, like I said, even during the Pepe thing, I was like making some streams where we were looking at it more. Maybe it was in the title because it was just starved for, for excitement and that, uh, it, it yeah. was able to offer some. So I definitely appreciated that. I have actually a good question from someone in the audience and I'm going to rephrase it for them. They basically, they said, what's the difference they said between Femex and Mexi. I don't want you necessarily to go Mexi, you know, about them, but just uh, maybe that's a good question of what what uh, separates Femex from, you know, uh, let's say, Bybit or, you know, just from any exchange yeah. of similar size and kind of uh, maybe standing and, and time in the game. Yes. Um, so for, if we take Mexi, for example, I think their approach as an exchange is to focus more on low caps altcoin. Absolutely. Listing everything, spot and futures. And we try to be a little bit more selective. So I think Mexi is trying to become the new KuCoin since now KuCoin is being uh, like, it's been, it's been having issue with regulators. They are enforcing KYC. So Mexi is taking like, okay, we can be the next KuCoin. So that's their approach. But as I said, we want to be a bit more conservative with the listings. So we try to stay away from like listing everything that uh, that wants to be on the exchange. Um, so we focus more on futures and having good liquidity on the exchange. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's our priority essentially to have uh, to make the exchange as, um, let's say, useful to high net worth trader, uh, high volume traders, professional mm -hmm. traders, people that have been in the industry for a long time. Um, so we hope that by providing good liquidity, a great matching engine, they will be able to execute their trades flawlessly and and stick around. And we see that the people in our exchange tend to, tend to stay for a long time. So we, mm -hmm. we receive positive feedback on that. Compared to, to Bybit, I would say for a long time, we basically offered the same things since mm. part of our team came from Bybit originally, um, which means that we have kind of the same mindset in terms of how an exchange should be run. If you look at Bybit, also they don't do listing of any of every uh, mm. altcoins in the market. They try to be selective as well, right? Uh, right now we are in the process of decentralizing, which is a little bit different of what Bybit is doing. So while, while Bybit launched uh, Apex and they're focusing on their layer two like Mantle now, 
um, us as an exchange, we want to make the exchange a hybrid between a, a sex and a DEX, uh, meaning that you want to allow users to participate in the exchange, uh, share the governance, and also share the growth of the exchange. Um, so we believe this approach will make uh, our customers happier uh, to, to engage with the exchange. And uh, since a lot of people have asked us, I want to invest, I want to be part of an exchange, I want the token. <laughs> so finally, we are um, building around that. Makes sense. I think the only, maybe the only thing more profitable than crypto is being an exchange, <laughs> exchanging crypto. <laughs> I've always wanted yeah, to have my own exchange. <laughs> yeah, I think the what happened in the past year, year and a half, revealed that other protocols are not, not profitable. Only exchanges are profitable. So yeah. uh, it's it's kind of difficult for for investors to rely on the revenue of the protocols to drive the value to the protocols, right? So very few of the centralized protocols are profitable or even have any users without token incentives. So people are like, okay, can I get involved with an exchange? And we said, yes, of course. Um, we are giving them uh, a chance to to grow with the exchange, to get engaged, to help us improve the product as well. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's through, I'm sorry, we're not, it, this is, there's no shilling. It's not a shill, um, yeah, <laughs> but is that through, no, 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 we, we're good. Uh, that's through the XPT, what is, what is the, the yeah, avenue? I know is a token. Uh, yeah, uh, Femex token, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, exactly, by, by holding the token and staking it, you will be part of the governance, part of the revenue sharing and this part of, and this kind of things. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I minted the soul pass and made some trades. I haven't checked on it too much, though. Maybe I should. Uh, yeah, you should have some tokens in your in your wallet since you if you trade with some. volume. I do have some, <laughs> not not a ton, because why does there have been been to trade really lately? But I've been trying. Yeah, that's true. How long? How do you feel about next year? Are you in the boat of next year is when things get hot again, or are you a little skeptical? Where Where are you there? So. I th I'm I'm optimistic since the elections are coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's gonna at some point like get the markets going in general, not only in crypto. I think there is still some 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 weakness, uh, like some structural weakness in crypto. Um, I don't want to say tether, but of course that's kind of like a question mark in the industry. Um, and uh, I'm a little bit concerned of the way tether and circles are relating to each other. Uh, so USD, USDT and USDC. The two market caps are not really um, making sense right now. Like what happens with one market cap and the other? So okay. that's my biggest uh, concern regarding like a black swan event. I think there is mm -hmm. still player holding out, which is uh, Tether. And in terms of BTC, I'm a bit worried about Michael Saylor as well, since the market mm -hmm. tends to punish those kind of players. Um, yes, it does. So those are the two things I'm worried about. Um, but I'm optimistic since I think it's time to get some excitement in the market and the elections are coming up. Mm -hmm. So I think those things will drive some, some attention back to our market. Are you, how worried are you about Tether? Because that's a really common worry that I hear from our audience, um, from people on the internet. I personally am not, and it's not that I think Tether is invincible or something, but to me, it's almost the Binance scenario where in the beginning of Tether, in the beginning of Binance, I would bet, though I have no evidence, I would bet they were doing some not so legit yeah. things. And yeah. at this point, they've been around so long and they've had so much resources. I think they have every incentive to tighten that ship up and make sure it's running right, you know, and to pass inspection. Um, so I, I kind of think that it, the Tether collapse is the boy who cried wolf thing, though... You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't have any information that everyone else doesn't have here. But what do you do? You think that I don't know. What do you think the odds are that we'd see something with Tether? That's real, not just I mean, a the, news story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean the market is pricing the odds very low. If you look mm -hmm. at the confidence in Tether. Yep. What concerns me is that people start to almost rely only on Circle for redemption for for stable coins. So the market cap of Tether is exactly the same since the bull run, which is resolved. Yeah. Um, I, especially if we consider that Alameda minted a lot of tethers, like 40 billions or something. So, yeah. So it's like, you know, there is a lot of question marks and tether is a bit of a black box, which I think it's, I don't want to say intentional in that regard. Um, but as you said, they started off at a very different time in crypto, maybe it was more like a wild west of yeah. the industry. We saw the same thing with Binance. So maybe, yeah, they will suffer a little bit for those steps. And I hope they didn't make bigger mistakes with their involvement with Alameda. That's my only concern. Yeah. I'm more confident in, in, in the USDC as a, 
as an institution. But uh, at, the, at this point, there are, their market cap is free fall. So the tether yeah. it remains at the same level. Yeah, I've been watching that and not even really putting that together. You're right. The, the market caps for stable coins have not behaved kind of how you would expect them to behave over the last two not years. At all. Not yeah. even, and I've been looking at it and thinking, that's weird, that's weird, and I just never put that together. Yeah, they they don't make sense. You would expect either like an expansion or a contraction of them based on price and you know, moving significantly. You don't, you don't. They really just kind of mint new coins every once in a while and it doesn't really seem to impact the market or, or really, you know, there's really no effect, it seems. I remember when we used to wait on uh, whale alerts on Twitter and look for big USDT right. mints back in the day. Like, oh my God, they minted a million. Oh, I got to retweet this. Everyone get high. That's a million dollars. And like, now it's just, oh yeah, they minted a billion. No one cares. Doesn't do anything. Burned a million. Yeah. No one cares. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And there's also like the involvement with Justin Sun, who's, I don't know, it's, it's a bit tricky. The way he's moving his USDT around between his DeFi protocols, HTX and all this kind of things. So it's, it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, uh, I don't know. You can't really see exactly what's going on. Well, USDC, I'm more confident, but the market cap is just going down. So it seems that people are using it just to redeem the stable coin in general into dollars or euros. Yeah. Do you think they're maybe swapping Tether to USDC and then withdrawing? Yeah, that's the conspiracy theories, right? Like you can print the yeah. Tethers, you swap to USDC, and mm -hmm. voila, you have real dollars that you just created from from nothing. But uh, liquidity is there, right? Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, the, the liquidity is still there. So the market itself is not pricing uh, these conspiracy theories at all, which is a positive <laughs> thing because that's markets tend to react very sensitively about these things. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the curve three pool is usually like a good indicator of the, of the health of stable coins. And I think mm -hmm. now it's doing fine, but sometimes like out of nowhere, you see some like unbalances, like, <laughs> so it's like, okay, what's going on? Um, mm. and, uh, yeah, like, I think users need to be aware of that. Sometimes you take for granted that a stable coin, it's worth $1, but it's not, it's like, we agree on it as a, like, mm. uh, let's say like a custom between the industry participants, but there are a few steps from going from a stable coin to your dollar back mm. in your bank account. So always be aware of which kind of stable coins you hold, where you hold them and this kind of stuff. I, uh, I want to ask you a question. I don't want to forget this one uh, because it's a really important topic. Maybe I'll ask it now, but then I'll forget what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. Uh, someone inquired, and this is totally relevant, I think, and always relevant in crypto. Basically, um, what kind of security measures does Femex take? And maybe um, are there any that maybe you guys do that other exchanges don't? Uh, kind of not just user side, but even on your side, maybe like with your cold right. wallet storage and, and stuff like that, because that's a big yes. issue and really important to everyone in this space. Yes, I think the, the standards for, for security in the exchanges have improved by a lot in the mm -hmm. past few years. Absolutely. I think now most exchanges rely on uh, uh, cold storage for most of the uh, for most of their uh, holdings and just a hot wallet for immediate withdrawals. And I think you can see that since all exchanges now have a proof of reserves page where you can check where the tokens are. And it seems you can see that it's not like a hot wallet. Like the movements are like daily, not like every every 20 minutes or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's been fairly important for the industry. And I think what happened with the FTX also forced us to improve even further our standards. Um, then of course, you know, we have the usual AML checks like a few about a month and a half ago, we found out that uh, DeFi protocol was hacked and the funds were sent on our exchange. So right away, uh, we you know we locked the funds just to see what's going on. We checked with the users, we understood what happened, and then once the investigation was over, we released all the funds. So we have pretty strict um, AML checks in that regard. And of course, the funds are mostly in cold storage, so they're not accessible by hacks or anything. Um, so yeah, in that regard, I think the, the standards are, are very high now and we try to improve them even further. Yeah, that's so important. Um, it's wild to me that exchanges used to operate mostly on hot wallets that they, like as a user of Bitcoin, I don't do that. Um, yeah, I don't know if you remember at some point there was this weird conspiracy theories about FTX because it seemed like they were using like a hot wallet with like a billion and a half in it. Which was kind of like move, the funds were moving around like different wallets, but always like on chain, like in, in from hot wallet to hot wallet. And it was very hard to explain what was going on. And and I think it was in 
early 2022 that people started saying like this looks weird maybe there is something wrong but at the time it seemed impossible so you can you can see a lot by the behavior of exchanges wallet i would i would suggest people getting a little bit familiar with this with this kind of aspect of the market that's a good tip check out exchanges hot wallets especially if they're publishing these proof of reserves that should yes. have their and hot if they wallets don't, if it's they a don't. red flag if they don't have proof of reserves if they don't then it's not really a proof of anything if they're not publishing this, it's, uh, I don't know what it is. Um, this yeah. is this is an interesting question that might be fun to answer. What's the most incorrect way that you've seen traders trade on Femex? <laughs> uh, and what right. would he recommend you don't do? Uh, so I don't so know. So there are yes, there are some tokens that are hyped a lot by um, content creators, public figures, uh, YouTubers, personalities on Twitter, like mm -hmm. the hype when the coin launch is very very high so people are just waiting to to buy and the first thing a lot of people do is like set the timer and get ready with a, a market order uh like a, a spot buy market order meaning that they're willing to buy at any price any price yep now, yes so sometimes these these tokens the first day especially they go since a lot of people are doing this they end up buying these tokens at the prices at which the market cap of the token would be twice the market cap of bitcoin you know because yeah. there's not enough liquidity in the market and you take a market order so you're willing to accept any price and then these users they tend to complain because they're like how did i get these tokens for a thousand five hundred dollars and there is no way to explain to them that like uh you cannot like once you take a ma market order you accept any price right you just want to get filled so yeah i would say that's probably what uh, most retail traders do bad. They try to buy into these hyped products mm -hmm. before they even launch. Um, and sometimes they get burned because there's not enough liquidity in the market or there's too many people trying to trade. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would suggest being a little bit more cautious. There's always time to buy a token later. Like I don't yes. think there's any token that has grown in a straight line from the launch until today. Like they don't exist, right? No. So I think you always get a, a moment in which you can enter if you think a project is valuable. Yeah, that reminds me of Bitcoin Cash on uh, Coinbase in like 2018. Oh, right. yeah. it, was, it traded it at like five thousand dollars for like a fraction of a second, and then didn't ever or, go or back. Or Zcash, there. I think they have a, a, an insane chart, right? That might have been too. There, actually, that's a cool yeah. question I have for you. So, exchange listings. I have kind of uh, conflicted thoughts, but exchange listings, when not just Femex, anybody lists a coin, and maybe you could actually shed light on, you know when Binance or Coinbase does, like the big, big, big names, do you view that as bullish for the, for that coin or project or bearish or kind of no sentiment? I think it used to be bullish, especially Coinbase and Binance. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think now it's been bullish for so long that people really front run it. So it's not mm -hmm. bullish anymore. Maybe like you can get like a good entry if you are, you know, if you're playing with API or something, you can get like a, a decent entry and, and take advantage of the first day excitement um but overall i don't think they are as meaningful as before uh, even though binance is still like the biggest exchange and Coinbase is still very big i don't think they have that kind of um uh, position anymore in which the the listing let's say is that impactful since they list so many coins every time they list something new the the let's say excitement effect decreases a little bit um so i think now it's fairly neutral if not bearish on certain tokens that have been around for months and other yeah. exchanges because if you look at maxi you can buy a small like a low cap token as if it was a dex right mm -hmm. so you get first the listing on maxi then maybe you get the listings on kucoin then maybe the listings on bybit and then you get it on binance so <laughs> i mean yeah. is it still bullish it's, it's just too late to to take advantage of any I, uh discrepancy in the market i'm glad you said that because that's pretty much what i've just you know just figured out or observed in the market is there was a time and i do remember that time being specifically when the market's super trending up when things would yeah. get listed and they'd fly up and it was mostly on coinbase and binance and i you know we don't know if that will come back when the market's super trending up but something that I've observed is if a coin is already on a bunch of exchanges and then gets listed on, say, Binance, it is almost always a dump. Almost always a dump. It almost always goes down from yeah. that day. Uh, and I explained it through that's, you know, people that needed larger liquidity that couldn't get it can now dump on Binance. Um, and so I've had yes. kind of that same mindset. Hopefully that changes in the future. Hopefully. Someone said that makes their favorite platform. Of, uh... <laughs> yeah. Also, FTX kind of 
introduce this concept in which as soon as you list a new token, you also list the perpetual futures for it, which mm -hmm. is not something that happened in crypto before, especially on low caps. So now the auto people don't want to even touch the token itself. They just want to trade it. So at that point, you are facing not only people buying and selling, but also people that want to short the token and try to yeah. short the initial candle excitement, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's even more risky than before, especially if you if you look at what's happening with Binance recent listings. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I've had you here for about an hour. We should we should probably wrap up unless you got all day. I know you're in a different time zone. Um, one thing I wanted to say while you're here, I've said this to the chat many times, Femex has been our my partner the longest out of anything. Uh, you guys really came in for me. I remember the day I reached out to you and I was like, hey man, things I know you know things are rough right now. Um, need, I'm looking for some help so I can keep making content. You guys were right there for me. And uh, you know, it's been it's been great. You know, I really appreciate working with you. I haven't had any issues using your platform for many years. I'm sure there are people out there and probably even in the chat that have, uh, maybe we could, maybe we could direct them somewhere that they might get Customer some help support, or something. Yeah. Customer support. Tell them the, the yeah. CEO said you're yeah. supposed to reach out yes. to customer support. There you go. Yes. Uh, um, I will speak with the agent right away to, to make sure <laughs> I'm on a call. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. Uh, if you have anything else you'd like to add, or you know, we didn't do any shilling, so if you want to shill something now, yeah, you, know, you got your time. <laughs> no, I mean, thank you for having me, Tom. I think it was a great chat. Mm. Um, I appreciate your insight on the markets. You know, you've been around for a very long time in this, in this, in this environment. So usually we have these talks on, on like our meetings. So it was great to have it more in public. I think it's always useful to get your your reads on, on stuff. So happy to. Uh, get the chance to to chat and hopefully we can do this again sometimes in the in next year or something absolutely my friend we'll definitely have you on again there he is frederico being awesome to show up here chat with us answer some questions uh thank you brother we will definitely have you on perfect thank you tom thank you guys bye-bye right, cheers brother all right all right all right i freak frederico's awesome how'd you guys feel about that I bet when you saw CEO Femex, you're like, oh, man, this is going to be shilling. Wasn't shilling. I figured he'd have some really cool info for us. Uh, just his take being someone who's, you know, up in the, I don't want to say ivory tower, but the ivory tower of behind the exchange and you know, seeing the things we can't see. Uh, that, that was pretty cool. Where is Femex based? I believe South Korea. Or it's either South Korea or Singapore. Man, I'm a terrible partner, aren't I? I used to know this. I'm sure that's an easy Google. I loved it. Yeah, he's awesome. So I didn't want to talk about our relationship, you know, too much when he was on. But Federica, when I first met him, 2018 or 19, maybe 19, um, I think 19, he was an affiliate manager and he was my affiliate manager. So when you work with an exchange as a, like a creator or really anybody, you get like an affiliate manager who's someone who basically you can ask questions to, they problem solve for you and like they set you up with like the referral links and things like that, different resources. And in the time that he was my affiliate manager, he moved to the position of CEO. I think that's freaking wild. So like I, I was with him. He's been with us since the beginning. He's, you know, been a believer of us. So, uh, you know, shout out to him. Love it. Singapore. There we go. How casual the interview was. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Kai. Kai is now my affiliate manager, the beautiful, wonderful Kai and my future wife. Don't tell her that, but pressure her into it. Humble guy. Yeah, dude, he's awesome. He, he's very much of our, uh, of our caliber, I want to say. I didn't do too much TA, honestly, guys, because look at the chart. Nothing has happened since last stream. We uh, did somehow Snipey's the bottom, the wick bottom uh, on the 11th. Did not quite hit 27K again yet, though. That's where I was looking to go short. I actually... I can't always be streaming. I do try to share all my trades and everything with you guys. Can't always be streaming all the time. Um, but I did actually open a little short, a little early. Let me see. There it is. A little short, little early. Half a Bitcoin hedging against my 1.1 Bitcoin long. 26.9. These positions are terrible. Don't do as I do. This is, this, this is why everything I say is satire, not financial advice. I uh, shorted under where I longed. Not, not a great strategy. But... Um, I was feeling, I was feeling impatient. The ape long on Femex is up 3%. It's still just sitting there. 
nothing has really happened. So I figured this was like a good timing, a good day to get somebody on with some information. I love this GBTC thing, by the way. I've been watching this all year and it just in the last, like, let's say if we remove maybe the last four weeks, including this one, like maybe five, it looks almost identical to Bitcoin. Almost identical. Of course, there's like a little deviation, but almost identical if you remove the last few weeks from GBTC, right? A little different, but a little different. But I, I think it looks very close. But the difference here is actually just exciting. Like, there is no lower low. The lowest point in price was a double bottom on the week in August. We moved up. We did break a high. You know, I complain about not breaking highs all the time. Higher low. And now we're right back up there. And it's looking like this week wants to close green on GBTC into Friday with this SEC appeal decision thing going on. Like, I could reasonably field an idea of this chart is maybe baking in something good. I can, I think that that is actually pretty reasonable. It very much does look like it. Um, inverting the chart here, I think will give everybody a little better view of what I'm seeing. Something like that. It's a little, it's not perfect. That's what I'm seeing. Maybe. I'm liking it. Uh, I would absolutely have alerts set if you're out there and uh, trading this weekend. I would have alerts set. They won't go off till Monday. But GBTC above 2190, I think basically right now, I think we're in like a strange scenario that Bitcoin's really never seen. I think that at this point, you know, we don't have an ETF and we're kind of not sure when we'll get one. But I th think that most people are in the opinion of we're going to get one, right? So I think that the market is slowly eroding this GBTC premium until it gets back into parity. And I think maybe what that's doing is putting a little less demand or a little less buying pressure on spot BTC with a little bit more on GBTC because it's at such a discount compared to regular Bitcoin in the hopes that this ETF will be approved. You know, maybe not this year, but like next year it seems it would be very hard to imagine 2024 without one. Probably said that in 2021 too. Um, but when this reaches back to parity, I have a feeling that Bitcoin will see a lot of spot buy pressure and that's going to start. <laughs> that That is going to be signaled that it's starting, not an ETF, but that buy pressure coming in on our break of this 2190-ish wick from July. And it just looks like it. This chart is much easier to be bullish on than Bitcoin spot. Like this... This almost looks the opposite, right? We almost look like we have a head, head and shoulders building on the week. Whereas on GBTC, it's an inverse head and shoulders. What would be really annoying, and I hope doesn't happen, is if GBTC rockets up to 26 and then Bitcoin dumps or something. And then they meet, they meet uh, at a zero premium that way. I hope that doesn't happen. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's Friday, guys. Breaking. Gary Gensler announces he loves crypto and is now dating do now dating Dua Lipa. I don't know who that is, but that's just a funny thing to say. He looks like Frankie Candle, Spanish cousin. Eh, eh. Handsome fellas. Has a decision been released yet? Not to my knowledge. There is no KYC on Femex. Well, there is, but it is not mandatory. You can KYC if you want like bigger withdrawal limits and stuff. True, pretty much everywhere. You want these shades, brah? You want to be a crowny? No, I'm kidding. Um, I look look for a company called Wear Me Pro W E P. I think they they might still manufacture them. If they don't have them, you can type in. I know Walmart carries like a brand of these, or they did. I haven't ordered them in like six months, but uh, you can type in blue mirrored box frame sunglasses, throw in the word polarized somewhere, and you should get these. I've gone through a bunch of different suppliers. I'm looking for my own manufacturer so I can just sell them, right? I would love to just be like, yeah, you can buy them from me. I got them on the cheap, but uh, it has been difficult. It's been difficult. <laughs> Zaza. Anyone buying Litecoin? Any, anybody anybody want some of those Litecoins? Do you, do you got any of those Litecoins? Oh, baby, I got so many Litecoins. 
I got through many light coins. Ooh, light coin. Uh, that that's a fill. Let's change this. Move this over. On the day, it's not there. On the day, it's only there in the week. Oh, that's a fill. I'll take it. This this could look worse, but it it isn't the worst. Maybe on the week. Let's go to the day on Litecoin. It's been a while. Not the best setup, but I do see a potential one, two, three triangular bottom potentially. We have a pretty flat top, kind of right around this sixty-nine nice range. Sixty-nine nice. If you invert that scale, you can kind of imagine if it doesn't break fifty-seven-ish. Then you have some kind of head and shoulders here, and you're looking for downside on the inverted chart, which is upside. Shoo, shoo, shoo. Woo. Let's see. 200 moving average on the day up at 82, 100 at 74. Trending down. 200 all the way up here. Wow. All the way up at 100 bucks. Rejected earlier this year from there. Um, man. Litecoin, I, I, the day you rally and melt everyone's faces, I will be watching you. But I probably am not going to watch it every day on a low time frame for... I'll continue not doing that for a while. Because you haven't been too spicy. It is Litecoin's birthday. I believe you're correct. I believe that is 12 years. So we should give Litecoin a happy birthday. And that's about it. You also should hit the like button. We got 500 viewers, only 200-ish likes. I didn't yell about likes as much as usual because we had Federico on. What's up with the Monero? You know what's interesting, uh, Psyche. Psyche, I don't know how to pronounce that. What's interesting is I was going through uh, my watch list like two days ago, and I looked at Monero. I don't think I had any like really exciting things to say. This is really old. I didn't have any like really exciting things to say, but I, uh, let me see. There was something interesting. Something interesting here. Let's get rid look at how old this chart is. This is how you know you've been like doing crypto stuff too long, man. Like oh my. This is like charting from seventeen, sixteen. Let's get rid of some of this. Do that. Go to a big time frame. Um it has held up really well. Kind of reminds me of XRP in a way, uh, in the sense of it's been at a low range and it hasn't broken that range. XRP did, it had that little Torres pump, but in general, it just has held this low range and doesn't seem to want to budge from it. Uh, I've been more bullish on XRP than maybe I've ever been over the last few months. Not that it's like immediate rally, but, um, that it looks like it's going to hold this range. And I think the same of Monero. This is on Bitcoin pair, ranging really between 005 and 0057 all this year, for the entirety of the year. So let me pull up I need a different chart from Monero. Not these old ones with really old stuff. This is old too, but not as old. Let's see. Was looking for a return. 469. Was. I still am, but not in the soon term. Really, like, so it's not an exciting chart. It's kind of like XRP hasn't really been that exciting, but you do see just higher lows. You do have a higher high here, so that's not bad. You even came off a higher high there. Um, But you're just holding this low, and I don't really believe that there are significant sellers left of Litecoin or really Monero. Like, neither of them have garnered attention or hype in five years, six years, five years, I don't know. Five years, six years. Long time. I think people who are who are afraid of this going lower have already sold. Already sold. Ah, uh, here's what I wanted to show. So it wasn't like super spicy, but if you zoom out, the Monero chart looks pretty interesting. Um, it does deviate from some of the other coins that did their mega pumps in 17 for one reason to me. You had a low down here. March was your lowest low. You did set a new all-time high, which is also not super common of these coins. But look at this. Instead of returning to the lows, it's kind of just settled down here 
and seems to be holding sideways. Now, could that play out with a dump down? Yeah, of course it could. But this is a different looking chart than many things. Like This is just a different chart. It stands out. I think that it shows strength, honestly. I think that it shows kind of relative strong, very strong strength. The low back here of 22 in May is right at the 0.5 retrace. That is very unusual. If you look at, like I said, Litecoin, Litecoin did not hold the 0.5 retrace. And if we look at its whole history, isn't quite as pretty. Now, it's not ugly. You do still have this higher low pattern. But you can see that the double top here, instead of a new all-time high, retraced almost all of the upside gain during 20 and 21. Monero is basically... Monero would almost be, let's see. It would be right about... Ooh, here? It's only half down from its all-time high. No, way more than that. Let's look at the 0.5. It would be like if Litecoin right now, instead of being at 61, was literally trading like right here at $100. That would be above its 50 weekly or monthly, 50 monthly. Uh, that would be a much stronger chart to me. So I have always loved Monero. That doesn't change. I just don't talk about it a lot. Monero, Litecoin, Doge are all, in my opinion, very similar. They're all passing the crown test of coins. I think that it... Uh, I think it's going to pull a sneaky on us sometime. I do have a hunch, though, that it'll be at a time where privacy, private transaction in crypto will have a value that maybe we don't, we don't perceive yet. Uh, I don't want to say for anything illicit, but just like for some reason that maybe the future will, uh, will show us. I don't know. It's just a hunch. Who def dat? What's up, V-Slim? Let me see. I do want to just shout out everyone who came and watched us today. Appreciate you. It was a great stream. Federico, great guest. He's the CEO of Femex, my personal friend. I uh, had a lot of cool alpha for us. There was really no shilling going on. Shout out to everybody who's here today. Love you guys. I hope you have a great weekend. I kind of think we're just going to see a crab crab weekend. Um, with the caveat of if we see the uh, SEC submit an appeal today, especially during market hours, I do expect to see a red candle, whether it's short-lived or not. Uh, I don't think it, it doesn't have really a logical reason for it to be like a mega red candle. It wouldn't be a change in behavior from them. It wouldn't be unexpected. Uh, but if we don't get an appeal, I would also expect to see a pump probably into this weekend at worst Monday. However, be cautious really in both of these scenarios. If the SEC does file the appeal, we get a red candle. It's likely going to return roughly back to wherever it dumped from. So let's say 26.7 uh, pretty quickly. And if we don't get the appeal and over the weekend or Monday, we see a pump up to, who knows, maybe 28 around the 200 weekly. That's likely going to get sold off too. This isn't a big deal. The market or participants are making it out to be a big deal. And in crypto, when we have that, we almost always see the same thing, which is a whipsaw on price action that returns roughly or basically back to where it started. Um, you guys rock. Make sure you jump in the Discord, like, subscribe, sign up with Femex, start trading with my link to, in the video description below. Join the Discord. I'll be around this weekend chatting in the chat, so I'll say hi to you there. And uh, that's about it, fam. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Crack some brews, roll some up, and I'll catch you Monday unless we get some crazy spice in the meantime. Crown out.